I'm a profoundly imperfect motherfucker. <laughs> so. Get that on a t-shirt. Welcome to Tipsy Talk with Guillermo del Toro. I can't believe I've just said that. Cheers. Hello. I saw The Shape of Water today. Great. I loved it. I really, and I love when I can meet someone and say, and just gush at them and say that I loved it. I it's really so much did. easier. It's, it makes my life a lot easier. So and thank mine. you for making and it mine. different. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can tell when people lie. Oh God, can you? That must oh, be awful. It's horrible. And I know. What do they say? Well, they say they liked it. <laughs> but they're lying. You make the movies, you're happy with them or you're not happy with them. And then if you're not happy with them, no matter how many people like them, mm -hmm. you don't like them. And if you're happy with them, no matter how people dislike them, part of you likes them. This is true. I can't imagine you've had a lot of that today, though. The vibe I got leaving the really cinema good. was that people were just blown away by yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, I heard the reaction was very good in it the was, theater. Everybody yeah. clapped at the end. It was, yeah, it was, it was really, really beautiful. I read somewhere, and correct me if this isn't true, that you said you had made this film somewhat as an antidote to what's going on in the world today. An ointment. An ointment? Is that what she said? <laughs> I wouldn't. It's a... Bit of cream. Rub, rub it on there. <laughs> exactly. Hope for the best. It's dermal application. <laughs> I really needed it. Right. I don't know if the world needed it. I think but we I did. Needed it. I needed it against the world because we are living in a time of great paradox. Um, on the one hand, in a beautiful and terrible way, both. Our social discourse has been codified to the point of almost uh, pillaring every human imperfection, mm -hmm. you know, online and so forth. And at the same time, the real interaction we have is this deplorable. So the, the paradox is those two things meet and clash, and the result is madness mm -hmm. and anger and hatred and fear. Jesus, but Buddha and Christ and the Beatles, they all agree <laughs> all you need is love. I think it's very hard for us, especially those that have those of us that have life online you have to be very brave to be emotional for real you're gonna get attacked no matter oh, what gotcha. you can say you know I say that online the news can be uh, mother of three rescues two of their child of her children from drowning as band goes down in river and then the the three comments down there, there somebody's gonna say why didn't she save all three what was she doing that was more important than saving the third one and it's crazy. It's crazy. I follow you on Twitter. You've quite a strong Twitter presence. Like you, mm -hmm. you tweet quite regularly, and I get this too when I'm tweeting. I feel like you're trying to fight the good fight. Yes, I am. And sometimes, no matter how hard you try, there's yeah. always someone who finds the one, like you say, the one well, flaw. Yeah, of course. In what you're doing, and they're sort of they're, they're sort of forgetting who the real enemy is and, and going after the, their champions a little bit. Well, too. I, I think I think I, except for politics, which I'm very transparent about my politics. I'm left of the left. I never ever tweet anything that is not. Beautiful, powerful, uh -huh. a suggestion of a film, a discussion of a book. I never will speak ill of anyone that is not in politics or that is an artist. I'm not, I'm not there to take anybody down. And that creates a certain atmosphere, but it's not impermeable. My aspiration is to be as imperfect as I can. And since I am an optional person, people can take me or leave me please feel free to take or <laughs> please feel free, feel free to leave, you know. But that's, that's where real art comes from, though. Yeah. It's not, for, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to watch a movie by somebody who is perfect. It's, it's your imperfections that make what you make beautiful and that well, really comes across in this in they're, particular. They're one and the same. Absolutely. Exactly what makes you a terrible filmmaker for some is exactly what makes you a great filmmaker for some. So the only thing you can say is be perfectly imperfect in your own way. If we get outraged about everything, Nothing is worth getting outraged on. <laughs> if we if we selectively and and and, and strongly and, and from a place of center, a, a real gravity of who you are, gravity center of who you are, you get outraged, then I listen. But it cannot be so knee jerk, you know? Yeah. And and, and and therefore it can trivialize things that are really important and make make really self important things that are trivial. I think teenagers now have it more complicated than I had it. I agree. Because I had to deal with this with school, mm -hmm. but their school you have a, you have a, a limitation, limitation to how to how much can be let in. Whereas now yeah. there's sort of the whole world is sort of in your living room with you all the time, and it's it's yeah. a, it's a lot. That's what is great about being 53. I tell you, because <laughs> once again I feel mm, there's always the option of 
closing the computer. Just switch it off. Yeah. But I, I think I think that is um, it's at the same time a, a wonderful tool. Mm-hmm. The way I think that this course has advanced about about gender inequality and and sexual harassment mm-hmm. has mm-hmm. been really fast, really strong yeah. with results. Yep. which is a big deal. And you do address it in this movie. So what was really interesting for me is it, it's almost a pastiche. It's sort of a 1963, it's a Cold War era American. Um, but it's now. But it's now. It, and the sexism and the homophobia and the racism and the oppression are all absolutely still prevalent today. So I found that the, the themes, which were relevant then and now, and then also even mirrored in the way that you shot it and everything about it being a very old world, almost mm-hmm. sort of musical Classical film. movie. Really yeah. classic. Yeah. Sort of B-movie horror, yeah. yet a musical, yet a completely a modern drama. twist. Yeah, yeah and it, you just, it's like Beauty and the Beast with Amelie with the <laughs> creature from the... A, a show Lagoon. by Douglas Sirk. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just, there's, there's an E.T. and there's so many inspirations in there. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you bring all of that and all of those movie inspirations and social inspirations and put them together in such a, a anyway, beautiful time? You do it through your gut. Okay. <laughs> Good it's, to a, know. it's a big uh, GPS. <laughs> you know, you're, if your gut tells you you're going wrong, you turn the other way. And if your gut tells you keep going, even if people go, what are you doing? You keep going. <laughs> Every story has been told. Free Willy is E.T. E.T. is... The, uh, it, it, it's, it's been told. Yeah. The only artistic act that we have left is uh, synthesis. The way we synthesize elements is what gives us our voice. You know, every song has been sung. So that's all we have, our voice and the way we synthesize the world. So that's what I do. I, I, I you know, I do uh, a caviar burger with a sprinkle of foie gras and a little bit of mayo. And you got to believe me. That you it's really not do. And it's yeah. on, on paper, you know, yeah. oh. the, the lizard man, gender is, lady that is, that is, story is, sounded crazy, but it uh, worked. That is my, that's been my life. On paper, I should have never made a single movie. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I'm glad things aren't just on paper. I have to ask because as an aspiring horror writer and director myself, I have to pick your brain. Something that I find mm-hmm. really fascinating is the way that you you change who the monster is. So in this film, the monster is not the monster. It's no. Strickland. It's no. the guy. The you know, human. It's it's the human guy. Who not is only the human. Everybody else is a human that swears he's perfect. Yeah. Is a human that swears he's decent. Mm-hmm. Is a human that thinks everybody else is alien, despicable, or invisible. Because I think there's nothing more monstrous than perfection or certainty. And I'm not completely certain of that, but, <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, look, if there's only one way to live, if there's only one way to uh, breathe, to work, to screw, then that is very suspicious. Because we all come with different solutions for our lives. Mm-hmm. And when somebody says this is the way it should be, this is the race that should dominate. This is the religion that should dominate. They are almost 100% in every case wrong and toxic. Yeah. And not only wrong, but toxic. Uh, Shannon and the movie make a good point of showing him to have his human mm-hmm, side. Mm-hmm. He, he he has moments of fallibility. He, do, he absolutely does. And you see the vulnerability sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he always kind of puts the facade back up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of, of the cast, I mean, Michael Shannon is stunning, as Amazing, always. Yeah. Sally Hawkins just, yes. oh, she's magical. She, she really, is. really is. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I feel and I hope that she's both an Oscar contender and winner this year. Um, I would like that for her, yeah, very much. But apparently she was quite collaborative on this with yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, through her agent, I said to her, I'm writing a movie for you. Then I told her myself, the worst speech in history, I was a little sauced because I was with Alejandro <laughs> and with Alejandro and Alf- Alfonso, and they had promised me we would get drunk. They they lied. I started early, and I, I, said, I, I saw Sally, and I said, "There's nothing worse than no, when you're no, more drunk than no, everyone." And, Maybe and, it's worse to be more sober than everyone else. I'm and, not then, sure. and then they said, "No, we're not." But I went to her and I said, "I'm writing a movie for you, and you fall in love with a fishman." And she went, "Great." Okay, cool. And then we met, <laughs> and she said. Uh, you know, you're gonna think it's a coincidence, and it is, but I was writing this movie about a woman that turns into a fish. No. And she gave me her notes, and I incorporated some of them into the movie, and then, you know, I would go with her to tap rehearsal, to sign language rehearsals, and uh, uh, every time I saw her do something, I would write a note, and, and uh, it was tailored. Tailored for her. You can, I think you can tell that. It feels very natural. It feels yeah. like she just sort of slipped into that role. It's for her. The whole thing is, it's her show, really. Well, you, it's, it's like if you're a composer and you write a song for a singer. Yeah. And that's what I used to tell her. Look, this whole world, I said, 
I created it for you. And that must be quite nice to get the call from Guillermo del Toro saying, I've written a film for you. Except my, except <laughs> for my accent, which is unintelligible. <laughs> I know that you grew up on horror, on Frankenstein yeah. and Creature and the mm-hmm. rest, but what is it that brings you back to it time and time again? And what is it that makes you mix it with other genres well, the way you do? It, it, see, like, uh, I, I adore horror, and I, I adore... But when you go to my house and you know, see the DVDs, bookshelves, uh, you know... You would be surprised that most of my movies are not uh, fantasy or horror. They're okay. comedy, silent. Like for this movie, I didn't put in the player a single horror movie at all because it's already on my DNA. I was watching Douglas Sirk, Frank Borsaggi, William Wyler, uh, Stanley Donen, Vicente Minnelli. Those were the movies I was. Minnelli came through. Yeah, Minnelli. That, that's that the melody and Broadway thing yeah. as well, kind of. And, and the color closer. saturation yeah. and the way the camera moves is very Stanley Don and very Minnelli, blah blah. blah. But I, I was watching movies that affected me emotionally, mm-hmm. and I thought uh, that's what I want to see. I don't want to see, you know, uh, what is in my DNA. So it's strange because I, I use horror as a static choice somehow, but I use more fairy tale logic than horror. Or yeah, movie logic, yeah, that's yeah. what it felt like that there were scenes that that dipped into mm-hmm. horror, but really for the most part, yeah. it didn't, it didn't stay it there. Didn't. And that, that's, you know, what, that's really good advice and really interesting. That I guess if horror is in my DNA, I just need to yeah. learn from all the other the well, other genres and kind of you know the the phrase the limit of your language is the limit of your universe, mm-hmm. which is said in in epistemology and semantics and so forth. It's true for uh, film and certainly for visual language. If you are a guy that consumes only pop movies and your vernacular is only pop movies, then you're going to be a postmodern self-referencing machine. But if your language encompasses world film, drama, melodrama, comedy, blah, 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 the more ample your language, the more beautifully fluid your vocabulary is going to be. And it's not going to be necessarily driven by genre or rules. Mm -hmm. You're very free, and it's sort of an eclectic, very diverse, interesting language, you know? I would sit here and talk to you forever and just listen to you talk about horror. Oh, it's empty. Oh, it, yeah, I mean, we, we should we should start another one. But in the meantime, I have to wrap it up. I hate to do it, but thank you so much oh. for being here. Um, that has been Tipsy Talk with Guillermo del Toro. Thank you so My much pleasure. for the advice. And congrats on the film. It's, it's stunning. So long, suckers. <laughs>